<laughs> okay, hey, welcome to our review tonight. We're going to have some fun. A couple of lame jokes, too, probably. But uh, we're, we're going to be doing some really interesting material tonight that is, um, it's, it's kind of environmental oriented. And it's, um, it's something that you're going to need to know. <laughs> Let's just put it that way, okay? And because a lot of these things are pretty obscure, and it's not something that you really use much in your own daily life or worry about a lot, you know, unless it happens to be a problem your home has, but then you worry about it a lot. But, but if you don't, uh, anyway, let's, I'll show you what I mean by just jumping right into the questions, okay? But before I do, is there anyone that has any burning issues or questions you'd like to ask before we hit tonight's stimulating material? Oh, that was your chance. Okay, so let's go to number one, please. <laughs> nobody, nobody piped up. Okay, which of the following is an environmental hazard based on the decay of radioactive material? Lead, I don't know if that disintegrates or decays much. Carbon monoxide, hmm, that's a killer. Let's, let's kind of hang on to that. But C, radon, and D, mold. Oh, yes. Yes, somebody guessed C and you're absolutely, well, you answered C, which is not a guess, was absolutely right. And that's correct, radon. Radon uh, comes from a breakdown of radioactive material. And you might say, well, wait a minute, you know, I mean, well, in Utah, this is a big thing because, you know, especially Southern Utah, because we had a lot of radioactive, uh, <laughs> radioactive, we had a lot of uranium mines and a lot of uranium uh, prospecting down there, uh, you know, in the Cold War era when uh, you know, uranium was worth a lot of money and people were really after it so they can make nuclear weapons and, and power plants and whatnot. But uh, radon is odorless and it's colorless. So how the heck are you going to know you got it or not? Well, they have little testing apparatuses and uh, sometimes they're just little boxes that you can set up and it sits there for a few days absorbing whatever is the gases might be in that area. Normally you put them in the basement and where you have a lot of problems is where there's uh, raw, or I should say untreated, or I should say unabated dirt. You know, I mean, if you went down to your basement and it didn't have a cement floor, it was just all dirt, you're, you're gonna have radon in the house. I mean, and, you know, face it. So definitely get that checked out. Um, if you're selling a home to buyers, um, I sold one not too long ago where he had actually taken a, uh, a circular saw of some kind and, and cut a hole in his basement floor because he wanted to dig a hole uh, through the dirt uh, and have like a root garden down there, you know, to keep things cold. Well, we, you know, I mean, so I test, we had the house tested and of course it had a radon. So uh, we went ahead and put in an, an abatement um, solution to that. It was about if I remember right, 800 or 1500, you know, I mean, it was under 2000 bucks. I think it was under 1500 actually. But um, what they do is they put in a, a, a pipe that goes from the basement all the way up uh, un unobstructed through the, you know, through the two stories or whatever it is, and then comes out of the top and he put a little fan on there. So it kind of uh, collects all that uh, odorless and colorless gas and then just blows it out in the atmosphere. <laughs> At least it's not in your house where you're breathing, okay? So that the correct answer to that is radon. And the important thing here, there's two keys. It's radioactive. Um, you know, I don't know how many of us carry around Geiger counters, but it's radioactive. Not, not a lot, but a little. And uh, it's odorless and colorless. And it's radon, okay? And it decays and it makes gas. Number two. Number two, which of the following contributes to mold growth? Now you, we all have seen mold and especially if you let your, uh, you know, bread sit around too long, you know, you see what that mold looks like. And we used to joke about penicillin. We gotta eat that so we can get some good penicillin, but it's, um, but what, what contributes to that? And uh, would it be A, airtight walls and windows? B, dry, dusty interiors? C, well-ventilated home, and D, central air. Now, the middle two, B and C, are, are kind of, the, you know, they're, you know, dry, dusty interiors and well-ventilated. And then central air would be kind of a ventilation system too, maybe, I don't know. But 
the correct answer to this, the thing that can contribute to mold more than, than B, C, or D is A, airtight walls and windows, because it can capture moisture and not, not dry it out. So, you know, a little bit of air circulation in a home is a good thing. Uh, some people want to make homes too airtight and it, it can actually cause a problem. So in a home that has been built to be super tight, you really ought to put some sort of ventilation system in it. Um, you know, to, and it keeps the, the uh, mold down. Now, a lot of, you know, mold, uh, and there's different types of mold, uh, but the one that people get concerned with mostly is black mold. And uh, I mean, as you can see it, it's black. It's like, you know, <laughs> it's like that stuff that men used to get to spray their bald spots on their head. You know, it kind of fills in with kind of a, um, I don't know, sticky stuff, but it, it looked it kind of matched their hair color. I don't know. But anyway, uh, airtight walls and windows to that one can contribute to mold growth. Number three. Now, you've heard about asbestos. Uh, it was a huge issue because we used to use it in construction of homes a lot, and uh, particularly in different types of insulation, and more specifically in, in some of the wraps that used to be put on pipes and some of these, you know, huge coal burning furnaces, um, that was that was asbestos material. A um, number of years ago, I sold a uh, old house uh, to a developer um, out in you know in the west area of town, and uh, they took they tore that house down, and because they were putting in a huge mall out there and whatnot, but it was. In order to get a teardown permit, now, did you know you had to get a teardown permit to tear a house down? Well, yeah, I mean, the cities will tax everything they can. And of course, they're, you know, they're concerned about that, you know, what are you going to do with all this material? Uh, well, we're going to take it to the landfill. Well, okay. So what they want to know is you have to have an inspector, usually they're an engineering firm, come out and go through that house. And he found asbestos in it, and it was mainly the old furnace downstairs with the, the uh, you know, the pipe wrap. And so uh, in order to um, tear that house down, they had to first, you know, bring guys in in monkey suits <laughs> and take all that asbestos out of the house first, because they didn't want that ending up in the landfill, and then, in there, you know, getting into the water table and, and whatnot. So um, uh, the correct answer to this one is C, fabricable, because Fagrigal means it can break into small little tiny parts. And, and uh, that's why they had to wear the monkey suits because, you know, they, you know, those, <laughs> you know, those hazard suits that they wear, usually they're white, you know, and, the, and they go in and they breathe through them. And, you know, they have all kinds of filters and whatnot. And they, um, because as they was taking the, the wrapped material off those pipes, it would get into the air. And, you know, and then, of course, would inhale that and it, it could cause a lot of serious problems. Um, one, one of the ways that you take care of lead based paint is B, you encapsulate it. Uh, uh, Lead is a toxin that can, and it can cause all kinds of problems in health and particularly with young children. And, they, and people, you know, in a home that has lead uh, paint, they would wrap their hands, you know, on the walls and kids are always licking everything in their hands and their walls. And, you know, or it, it would flake off and they would think it's something to eat <laughs> and eat it. And that lead wasn't good for them. And so one of the ways that they, they took care of that was to encapsulate it. And it's the same thing with asbestos. If you have a little bit of asbestos, like those pipes are wrapped, you can wrap over the top of them with something else um, so that they don't become uh, fragrable. And then, uh, you know, if you hit them, then of course it's going to spread through the basement and then up. Eric, the yes, it's pronounced friable. Oh, I'm sorry, friable. And I've never heard it in a conversation. I had to look it up. <laughs> yeah, well, thank you. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Uh, the phonics has never been my my strong suit, guys. So, but uh, but I can pass this exam and I can teach you how to do it too. <laughs> but. Uh, Anyway, friable, really? I mean, like we can throw it in a frying pan? Hmm. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Well, it's not crystallized, it's not <laughs> crystallized and it's not saturated and it's not encapsulated, okay? It's friable. We ought to be able to remember that somehow or another. Friable, we got to tie that together with asbestos. 
One of the best ways to do that is to get a good, good vocabulary uh, a program that has uh, um, flashcards and then, and then watch it, particularly one that's been done perfectly for real estate. I have one of those uh, and it's free. You can find it somewhere. I think <laughs> Rick, rickroller.com, I think. Um, but you're welcome to download that and use that if you'd like. And uh, okay. Uh, CERCLA is primarily to handle water rights, building codes, hazardous materials, or wetlands. Tie this one to hazardous materials. Okay. Um, and this is the law that would probably require the, the inspection, uh, or at least give them the opportunity to pass a city ordinance that you needed a teardown permit yeah, because we don't want all those materials in our landfills because you know water seeps through there and it gets in the water table and causes all types of hazards so the correct answer to number four is c hazardous waste hazardous waste we have a lot of hazardous waste in utah uh, because we have uh, enviro therm uh, and other firms that uh, actually collect it from all over the country. Actually, a little bit of it is collected from all over the world. Um, and then we dispose of it out in the West Desert. So we have a lot of it around. Number five, former industrial sites where they, they may still be environmentally contaminated are called uh, brownfields, graylands, wetlands, redfields. Well, <laughs> you've got your choice between brown, gray, and red, okay? And it's going to be brown because it's industrial, okay? It's brownfields. And uh, we have a number of brownfields all over Utah in one way or another. Mid Midvale uh, on the West End is one of the largest ones. There used to be some uh, steel factories out there and whatnot, and they, they uh, caused really a lot of problems, particularly in uh, Old Town uh, Midvale. You know, there's an old town, old town Midvale. It's really kind of funky. It's just lasts like two or three blocks, but it's uh, cool old buildings and whatnot. But you can also see in that area out there a number of big mounds that have been covered. And the way they took care of those brownfields was they actually, uh, well, kind of like encapsulation, they they capped it. And they had to cap it with certain types of material that would, you know, that would. Uh, compact and then they you know were watering it while they were doing it you know they had engineers figure all this out but the idea was is that when you're working with a brownfield type of an area like that the contamination is still there so you probably don't want to have uh, garden products uh, grown in those lots uh, unless you're using grow boxes um, it's where you brought in soil and, you know, that they, they're actually growing in there, like a greenhouse type si situation. But um, they're quite, you know, they're a lot more common than you might think. In Park City, we have a lot of uh, mill tailings uh, from some of the silver and, and other mines that they had up in that area. And they would just go dump it, you know, and it'd be a big pile and they'd smooth it out. So uh, as the city grew and, you know, turned into not just a mining town, but actually a resort. And, you know, ski areas were put in and beautiful restaurants. And, you know, it has become a world destination. And of course, we had the Olympics in 2002 there. And of course, throughout the rest of the state as well, and at least the northern part of the state. So, um, but in, in certain parts of Park City, you have some of those meal tailings that were just spread out and then they were they were capped, you know, just like they did in Midvale, only the caps are not quite as uh, deep. So uh, people need to be informed when you're buying in some of those subdivisions that were put on top of those brownfields of, of exactly what they, they are. And, you know, they're counseled not to put in gardens, but maybe, maybe the grow box kind of an idea uh, because you, know, you can pull some of that. And I mean, you don't wanna be digging up your carrots to be contaminated by, uh, heavy metals and whatnot probably would not be a good carrot to eat. And that's one of the reasons why uh, it, you know, we've got away from this a little bit in real estate, Mark, you can chime in, on, or Dan, you can try to chime in on this. I was talking to Mark about this earlier, but um, seems like uh, 
used to be that, you know, you kind of worked your area because there were things about your area that you needed to know, you know, like in Park City or Mid Midvale in, in those areas. And, uh, but now you know, people have embraced the concept that you have a Utah license that's good all over Utah. <laughs> and so, you know, we see people down in central Utah, you know, from Provo and whatnot, uh, or even Salt Lake that list homes down there all the time. You know, well, it's an hour and a half to go down there just to show the home. So, you know, I don't know how they work all that out, but it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, they probably have someone local that covers for them, but kind of interesting. But uh, my point is, is that knowing the area that you're working in and the peculiarities for that area and some of the caveats that need to be done are important. You know, in the Western part of the Valley here in Utah, we have some phenomenal subdivisions out there now, absolutely gorgeous and beautiful parks and little lakes that you can go around and whatnot. But to tell you the truth, Kennecott has um, put some pretty hazardous materials in some of the water out there. And so to make up for that and, and you know, and to help things and to make up for what they did, um, they put in the biggest um, reverse osmosis water purification system in existence. And it's, it's down there, and I think it's in West Valley, maybe, or maybe West Jordan, but it's a huge facility. Uh, and they have, they have the, uh, this huge uh, RO unit that they put in, and so they push the water through there in order to take some of those contaminants out of it. And then it goes through a regular municipal water treatment type process. But for a long time, Dan, do you remember uh, in, when people were buying homes in the way far west area and some of those newer neighborhoods, they... You know, the developer is actually supplying them with bottled water. Did you remember that? That's been a long time. That's, that's way before it all got developed like it is now. Yeah, yeah. And so they've done a, a great job in, in cleaning that up and trying to make it good. But um, these are questions that people may ask that you should probably have some kind of a background in. So talk to experienced agents that have been around. You do some Google searching and you'll be up to speed. Okay. Let's do the next question, please. Number six. Okay, we've got some wetlands and uh, they're very important, uh, you know, especially around uh, the Great Salt Lake. Now, because of the drought that we've been in, some of these wetlands have, have kind of dried up, uh, but they're very important because we have a, a whole variety of birds that, that need those in order to exist. A lot of them, they, it's a stopover on their migration uh, as they go south for the winter. Uh, but a lot of them come and they, you know, they hang out here and it's, it's important uh, that, you know, they have a place to come to. Um, but so we have wetlands and then we have some development, but usually there's kind of a, an area we call a buffer or D, but it's a distance between the wetlands and buildings and a parcel land is, is a containing regulated wetland is called a buffer, a buffer zone. And you might think, well, that's a great place to, you know, build additional properties or whatnot, but, it, but it's not, you know, because a lot of it, if it's wetlands, it's hard to build on anyway, because of, you know, I mean, you can't put a basement in and, and uh, your other foundations have to be in, engineered very carefully. And so that your house doesn't end up settling because of all the wetlands. Um, but it's not a no-fly zone. It's not a safety zone. And I guess you could almost call it a no-build zone, but that's not the correct term. The correct term is buffer. It's a buffer zone, okay? And good planning in a, in a well-planned community, you have these buffer zones. And, you know, an example of a not very well-planned community is just a little bit north of where Dan is, <laughs> out there in North Salt Lake and, and some of those areas out there that where they... Uh, uh, have put subdivisions right next to the oil refineries. And, you know, it's kind of a stinky, smelly thing to live next to. <laughs> I mean, uh, usually you would have a heavy industrial use like that. And then you'd have a less heavy industrial use like warehousing and whatnot. And then you'd have an area of maybe retail or maybe apartment buildings. And then you'd have some single family. But, you know, that would be much better because each zone, uh, you know, creates kind of a buffer between something obnoxious or noxious and something where you might want to live and spend and spend. No, we had a, we had an incident like that in Bountiful where at the oil refinery, there was some kind of, there was some kind of explosion that happened 
and it sent a shockwave through the neighborhoods and actually shattered windows in all the houses that were built too close. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, that's why they usually try and separate those things. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I was talking about smells and maybe uh, chemicals, but, you know, <laughs> Dan's talking about actual physical damage to your house, you know, because something went boom in the night or the day. Yeah. Either time would be just as disconcerting. Number seven, please. Okay, the Environmental Protection Agency, the EPA, enforces. Well, what does the EPA do in environmental protection? Uh, clean water laws, that sounds pretty good. Water rights, water rights. Ah, that's the state engineer's office, water rights. Building codes. No, that's the planning and zoning guys. Lending laws, well, there's a lot of the state, local, and federal, uh, and mostly federal uh, regulations on those. It, you got to go with A, clean water laws, and that is the correct answer. The EPA is very concerned about you know, contaminants and what happens with those contaminants, and they definitely want to try to keep them out of the water table. So... Enough on that. Questions so far, anything we've talked about? Okay, let's do number eight, please. It is fraudulent for a broker to, A, disclose that they have no knowledge of environmental issues. Hey, I, I, I don't know anything about that, okay? And I'm disclosing I don't know anything about that. Well, I don't know if that's fraudulent. That's just showing that you don't know much about that, okay? B, reveal environmental hazards in their, um, that their client has asked them not to reveal. Well, environmental hazards in a home uh, definitely is something that could be considered a material fact, something that could uh, significantly uh, alter or perhaps influence or change the value of something. And therefore, it must be re revealed. So um, just because your clients ask you not to tell doesn't mean <laughs> you got to tell them, look, folks, I can't do that. I mean, I have to tell people uh, about that environmental problem. So that doesn't work. Um, C, deliberately misrepresent the condition of the property. Oh, that sounds like a good course of action. <laughs> well, we're looking for something fraudulent. You know, that's our, so that's probably a really good, good answer. In fact, that is the right answer. D, advise the seller to disclose all environmental issues. And of course, we would do that. That's not fraudulent for you to say that. That's what you have to say. You know, we got to let pe people know. I mean, we got to work with the cards we've been dealt. And if the, we need to fix some things, we need to go fix them, you know, get mold out of the house or, or whatever, or at least disclose it and let them handle it when maybe for a discounted price or whatever. Uh, recently, one of, one of my uh, young trainees that bought a home for himself, well, I guess it's been two years ago now because he just sold it. Um, he's following the five homes to freedom plan, you know, where you can actually buy a home and do a little cleanup, fix up try to push the value up and every two years because of the tax code allows you to sell your personal residence with no taxable incident every two years you do that then upgrade to your next home and then in, in 10 years you can actually buy that fifth home free i mean i mean not you buy it free but you'll have the money to pay for it free and clear kind of kind of so he's following that plan the only hiccup is <laughs> he can't find another house to buy <laughs> So that's kind of screwing up the plan right now. So he's living in one of his dad's rental properties till he can find one. Number nine, after the seller accepts an offer on a property, the listing broker discovers damage in the ceiling caused by a leaking roof. What do you got to do? You got to run around and tattle to everyone, guys. A, you got to immediately inform the buyer's agent. It's under contract and you just found out about it. Talk to the sellers, folks, you know, we, I didn't know you had a leaking well. We didn't know either, you know, well, we, we, we have to inform the other agents so he can inform the buyers. Well, can't we just hide it? No, <laughs> no, we can't just hide it. We got to let them know. So you immediately inform the buyer's agent. You don't go to the buyer direct. They have their, they have an agent. Don't get between an agent and their, their uh, client and, unless you have to. And, and when, if, if you have to, 
uh, you have to be very, very careful about that. Um, you have to try to contact them a certain number of times. This, this changes from board to board, but usually it's three or four times over a period of time, can't get a hold of them. And that also includes trying to get hold of their broker. Remember that the broker actually owns all the listings. So if you can't get the agent, call a broker and say, look, I've been trying to get a hold of your agent for weeks. He says, oh yeah, they, have, they had a really tragedy happen in their family. They're up at the hospital and I, you know, they're just a little bit incommunicado right now. What, how can I help you? Well, we just found this out and, um, you know, so I've got to let the buyer, uh, you, you will want to let the buyer know, you know, so, you know, now if you can't get a hold of the agent or the broker, uh, make sure you work with your broker on that one and let your broker kind of carry the water on that. Cause you, you know, there are rules that you don't want to, uh, cross the line on. So the correct answer to number nine is A, immediately inform the buyer's agent. And that just makes good common sense. You know, we need to be forthright and honest in what we do. We, we have to, you know, yeah, it's mandated by law, but you wanna, you wanna be that kind of person anyway. Number 10, number 10 says a real estate agent uh, closes a deal and the buyer's out of the country and cannot attend the closing, what should the agent do? A, go ahead and go to the closing yourself and sign on their behalf. I mean, after all, you are their agent, right? And eh, no, that's totally wrong. You can't do that. A listing agreement doesn't give you the authorization to sign, you know, whether it's a buyer's listing or a seller's listing. The only thing that gives you a, a authorization to sign, folks, is this number B, advise the buyer to have an attorney draft a power of attorney and they ought to have someone be the attorney, in fact, um, that's you know, given that power to sign for them uh, through this document called a power of attorney. Make sure uh, that you don't just pull a power of attorney off the internet. It, if, if you know you're gonna be in this situation, make sure that the buyer's lender has a power of attorney that they're happy with because they may not be happy with the power of attorney that you got off the internet or that your broker had in your uh, computer file. Uh, they may want to use a very tight definitive one that their lawyers have prepared. Otherwise they won't lend the money to make the deal work. So, um, and they're not going to be real happy about using a power of attorney on loan documents either. They may just want to do electronic signatures. But that's not one of our uh, opportunities here. But, but you cannot attend the closing and sign because you're not authorized to. Now, should you be the attorney of fact for your client? Says, well, can you just do that and sign them for me? No, you really shouldn't. Um, the e &O insurance carriers don't like that at all. Uh, your broker's probably not going to approve that. Um, there's a conflict of interest there if you stop and think about it. Let me see. I got a power of attorney so I can go ahead and sign and close this deal for my client. If I don't sign it, I don't make a commission. <laughs> if I do sign it, I make a commission. Well, you know, that's conflict of interest. So, you know, they need to find someone, you know, that they trust that can sign for them. You know, someone who's not out of the country that may be a relative of theirs or a lawyer or a friend or someone. And it shouldn't, shouldn't be the agent. I'm sure your broker would have big heartburn over over that. Get errors and emissions insurance. Well, errors and emissions insurance is a really cool thing and you really ought to make sure your broker has it. Uh, some brokers are kind of like self-insured. You know, they have a huge uh, legal defense fund that they've been accumulating for years and uh, that's okay too. But un un understand that mistakes can be made and uh, it's good to have someone backing you up behind you, you know, to help uh, take care of some of that. Um, and a D, uh, create an addendum to purchase contract that allows the agent to sign for the buyer. Uh, an addendum that says, hey, everyone understands that I'm signing for the buyer, it doesn't, isn't going to cut it. So the keys to this one are, of course, uh, advise a buyer to have an attorney draft a power of attorney. But from a practical standpoint, make sure it's okay with if, you know, if with the buyer's lender. And uh, I'm, I'm talking about e e either side. I mean, if you're representing the buyer and, and the, the seller is gonna use a power of attorney, make sure that you know, the lender's okay with that. You know, um, 
they'll probably be okay with it as long as the title company is going to insure it because that puts the title company on the hook. Um, but just, just know that if you're going to use a power of attorney on something, uh, and it's not uncommon here in Utah, we have, we have a large number of our population that uh, well larger than a per capita, the rest of the country that are in the military. And a lot of times are shipped out. They, 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 they can't come to a closing. Um, and there is a kind of a uniform one uh, power of attorney that the, the military has, but that may or may not satisfy the lender. So just make sure that the guy that's actually bringing most of the money to the closing is okay with the power of attorney, okay? You know, these are little things you pick up um, as you go along. Um, you know, experience sometimes is what you uh, get when you were expecting something else, like, like a commission. <laughs> but the deal fell apart, but you learned something. And so in the future, you can hold those together uh, with a little bit more experience. Don't, but, but, you know, I don't want to scare anyone. Uh, there's Usually there's plenty of time to pull all this stuff together as long as you find out about the problems early on. So, you know, uh, find out what the situation is with your buyers and with your sellers. You know, are you, you know, could you be called out of town any one particular time? And the guy says, yeah, I'm, I'm on a special task force with the FBI and, you know, that's my job. I've been there 20 some years and, you know, I get called up and I might be out of town for two, three weeks. Well, you know, you have to anticipate some of these problems. So, you know, you might want to have a power of attorney ready to go, a power of attorney document ready to go in case he does get called out of town or she, you know, so just think about that. Okay, number 11, how long must lead-based paint disclosures be kept by a broker? Now, lead-based bank disclosures have to be given on homes that were built prior to what year? Who knows? 19 what? 79? 78. 78. Very good. Very good. Very good. That's one you got to remember. It's going to be there. Um, but... Um, now we have that document and it was used in a transaction. How long do brokers have to keep documents? Well, um, three full calendar years following the year of, um, three full calendar years following the year of the transaction. So, you know, we're in December of 2021. So you have a closing this month. And then uh, what happens is, um, you have to keep that three full calendar years following the year of the closing. So in this case, you're gonna to have to keep all those documents if you're the broker for uh, 37 months, you know, three years, 36 months, but they have to keep it for December too. So it'd be 37 months. Um, no, no big deal. I, I would advise all you guys, because you're not gonna be a broker to start with, it takes a minimum of three years to become a broker. So, you know, so even if you're on fast track to become a broker, it's still going to be your first three years are going to be under some other brokerage, some other broker. And um, you need to keep your own records. Don't depend on your broker to keep your records. I, I did a lot of deals. I was their top agent for a broker that got divorced and decided she wanted to move to um, Washington State. So she packed up all her records and took them with her. Well, I mean, that's going to be difficult for me to get access to those. Um, technically speaking, she should have let the division know that she was leaving the state and where those records are going to be kept. And they should have been kept somewhere in the state. But, you know, I mean, what are you going to do? She left the state already and gave up her Utah license. So she, you know, our division really doesn't have much sway over her anymore. But anyway, the point is, is that you need to keep your own records. Why? Well, because sometimes clients call and they say, um, especially in the year of a transaction or the next year after it, and they'll say, oh, you know, we can't find our settlement sheets. You know, can you send us another copy so we can get them to our accountants for our taxes? Okay, fine. Maybe it was being used as a rental or something. And it was very important that they have a copy of those documents. So it's just easier, you know, to have your own copy. Um, 
and there's other reasons why you might want to do it. You might want to just, you know, I mean, keep a track of those anniversary dates and send out cards and stuff to your people and doing database marketing. But um, it's three full calendar years uh, on the rule from the division. So that would make this, he's got to keep it for three years or so. Uh, five years, two years, one year, it's three. Remember three, okay? Number 12. In uh, fulfilling a listing agreement, one of the major risk areas is, in fulfilling your listing agreement, one of the major risk areas that will get you in trouble is A, finding a buyer and turns out to be unqualified. Well, you know, sometimes buyers appear to be qualified. They may even have a pre-qualification letter, but it's not a loan commitment. And so when they really dig into it, they find out they don't qualify. And that can happen to anybody. Uh, so that's not uh, a risk uh, to say, uh, you know, as far as like, you know, a license infraction or something like that, but, but it, it can happen. Um, I, I, I have real strong feelings about this, folks, particularly these days when working with a buyer is a longer process than it used to be. Um, what I mean by that is we're getting into all kinds of bidding wars. Now, it's, it's, the market's cooled a little bit, but on hot houses and hot areas, they're still hot. And so you're going to get multiple offers, and you might have to make offers on four homes before they, you finally get one. And usually it's because the buyer says, well, I'm fed up. I love this house. I'm not going to lose this one like I lost the other four. And uh, so I'm, I'll pay 50 grand over the appraisal. That's <laughs> what they're doing in order to lock it down. And so, um, you know, it takes a lot of work. So you don't want to be writing all these offers without having a real firm warm, fuzzy feeling that your buyer can actually qualify for a loan. Now, I, I'm a big advocate of getting all your buyers pre-qualified, not just, you know, I mean, and get a loan commitment before you take them out in your car, you know, and it's, uh, I, I'm a big advocate of having a, a lender that you work with and sending virtually all your business to that one lender. Now, um, you hear a bunch of garbage uh spouted about in our industry oh well you always have to recommend three vendors you know like three lenders three title companies three home inspectors you know <laughs> no no you don't there's no rule at the division that requires that it's not going to get you off the hook if you recommend three idiots and they pick one of the one of the three scrooges uh and they're very unhappy with you from recommending them only recommend good competent people and if they become incompetent I had a lender I used for years. She went through some life experiences and started, you know, drinking heavily and other problems. And so therefore uh, I had to sit her down and says, you know, I love you and you're a wonderful lender and we've done all these deals together, but you're in a really bad place right now. And I'd like to help you get out of it. But until you do, I can't use you as a lender anymore because you're screwing up deals. You know, I, I can't recommend you. And she did straighten up. You know, and so I could start recommending her again. But it's don't recommend some us not recommend a bull, but don't recommend a handful of people because it's it's it isn't going to get you off the hook anyway. Look, everybody's business is no one's responsibility. And you want to be important to that lender. You want to have three or four loans with them at all the times so that if they have to stay late and work on which deal, which deal they're going to work on yours why because you send them so much business you know if if they know you shop them every single deal you know and maybe you get it maybe you don't you know that's that's not the relationship you want you want them dedicated to getting your people qualified and doing it correctly so that you know dang well if they can get a loan especially in this market when you have to spend so much time with them you know it's just you know, just that's what you're selling you're selling your expertise and your time Anyway, it's tough. Okay, so anyway, it's not finding a buyer turns out to be unqualified. B, exceeding the authority of the agreement. This is a very tight agreement. It tells you exactly what you're qualified and can do. And what, you know, and beyond that, you're exceeding your authority. 
you, you can't sign documents for a seller that exceeds your authority. And other things as well. Uh, showing the property, like having a big pool party at their house because you know they're out of town for the weekend. And boy, they got a nice pool. So, you know, that would be exceeding your authority unless you had their permission. Showing the property without the, the presence of the owner, you know, that happens a lot of times. In fact, we recommend to the owner that they leave so that the buyer can open drawers and do things that, you know, they would feel uncomfortable doing. You want them considering that house as their house, not as your house that they're buying for themselves. I mean, they, they need to be able to try things. You know, maybe they'll figure out that those drawers in the kitchen were quiet, quiet clothes. So they open it and they push it and it lasts a little bit, kind of does on a quiet clothes, a little piston thing in there. And it's, man, that's really cool. You know, so they might see things that they, uh, you know, they wouldn't have seen if they didn't feel like they could look. Um, so normally we ask them to leave if we can. Um, besides, besides, they might say the wrong things, you know, or, or give up something they shouldn't give, give up. Uh, anyway, D, uh, cooperating with other licensees. Well, obviously we need to do that. I mean, that's one of our major strengths in our industry is we have, we're mobilizing the entire real estate community to get their house sold, not just you. Correct answer number 12 is B, exceeding the authority of the agreement. Most of these are common sense, huh? But it helps if we go through them. So when you see them again, <laughs> you won't be surprised by some of them that you didn't know or weren't quite sure of. Number 13, in performing a, a, a CMA, a competitive market analysis, a licensee must be careful. A, to use the term market value whenever possible in report. Market value, market value, market value. Eh. B, show a low suggested selling price to avoid a complaint of misrepresenting the value. Usually when an answer rattles on much longer than the other ones, it's wrong, <laughs> as, it, as it is here. This is not the right answer. C, include the results of a certified appraisal in the analysis. Well, if you had a certified appraisal, why would you need to make a CMA? You just use that, check the responsibility on someone else. Uh, D, avoid creating a false impression that the licensee is a certified appraiser. And that's, that's it. And performing your, your CMA, you gotta tell them that I'm not a licensed appraiser and this is not an appraisal. You know, appraiser might come back and come up with a different number, uh, you know, and we'll work with them on Okay, those are the uh, questions for tonight. Do you have uh, some additional questions that we can go over or things that you're, you're puzzled about? Cynthia, Larry? No, not at the moment, thank you. Okay, well, thanks for coming. I, I appreciate it. Um, you know, uh, what, one of the things I, you know, I'm, I was meeting with the title company rep the other day um, at one of the title companies that I use. And uh, I have two title companies I use primarily, one of them that likes to do out-of-town closings and another one that doesn't. Um, uh, but the, it, it, one of them is owned by a lawyer. So if there's complications, I know they're going to be on the title. I kind of push them over there so he can understand that better. And, and not, he's not afraid of problems. <laughs> he's used to solving them. Uh, but, um, but anyway, this uh, uh, business development guy you know is a guy there that's that is there to help grow the grow the business and the main way you can grow your business is by making sure you get lots of agents coming through the door with business so i recommended he get this book called hot prospects written by my my good friend bill good and uh bill wrote this book uh it, it has various uh it had other other titles the main title the original title of this book was called prospecting your way to sales success um, I would recommend you get online and try to find a copy of Hot Prospects by Bill Good because this is the one he wrote after the do not call list legislation went into effect. And um, he talks about how to deal with that, but he also talks about how to create a database um, and do database marketing. And I, uh, I have worked a lot with new agents in helping them make rookie of the year. I've done eight of them now that have actually earned that or rookie, you know, the outstanding rookie at their firm. Um, and uh, 
and, and I've worked with a lot of experienced agents that seem to have hit a plateau and can't seem to kick into the higher money. You know, maybe they're making 75, 80, but, you know, they want to make a hundred and a half or 200, you know, and I, I've helped them, you know, break through that glass ceiling and get to the other side. But one of the main ways you do that is database marketing. And I, it just mystifies me on why, you know, I could sit down with an agent, they've been in the business three years, they're doing okay. You know, the first year they only made like 50, then they made like 60, and now they're 75 or 80 or so, but they're, you know, they can't seem to break through a hundred grand and make a hundred and a half or 200 or whatever they want to make. And uh, I sit them down and I, I say, well, you know, how large is your database? And they say, well, I really don't have one. And, and I said, that's, you're not going to get to where you want to go without a database. And there's all kinds of uh, customer relationship manager programs, CRM programs out there. Free ones work well. There's, there's others that you can pay a lot of money for that work better. But still, you need to keep your clients and your prospects in the databases. And you need to keep in contact with them regularly. And the rules of database marketing, according to Bill. Now, I should tell you that Bill, Bill's background is he didn't work with agents, uh, real estate agents in particular. He worked with, with registered agents. He worked with stockbrokers. And he would take a stockbroker who's making a, a million dollars a year in commissions, okay? And he would push them into that two and three million dollar category. You know, and, and he did it with database marketing. You know, your clients need to be in a database. It works for real estate. It works for insurance. It works for anyone that's trying to build a book of business. And I've studied this for years. How many people should be in that database? The answer is for real estate, 800 people. If you have 800 people in your database and you are contacting them with two rules, number one, they have to get something from you in the mail every month. Snail mails fine, but uh, email works too, as long as they're email users. And number, the second rule is they have to have a voice contact with you every 90 days, minimum of every 90 days. So something from you in the mail every month, email is okay, and a voice contact every 90 days. Now, if you go to a party, like a family wedding or, or you know, baptism or whatever it might be, and you see three of your clients there because you do a lot of business with your family, and you mention real estate, real estate has to come up in the conversation, then you can mark that down and, and that's part of your 90 day contact. You don't have to contact them until the next 90 days, but your database will keep track of that. Now, Bill also tells you in this book that you shouldn't be running your own database. Now, I know some of you are starting out, you're gonna start out running your own database, but you're only gonna have 30 to 300 names in it. When you get to be, you know, the six, seven hundred, eight hundred names like you should be, then um, you need to have, have someone else run it. And I recommend you get someone out of the Philippines. And uh, yeah, I have a, a gal in the Philippines that used to do uh, Facebook posts for me, and she would do a thousand Facebook posts for eighty bucks a month. I mean, crazy cheap, and they're so polite. Well, most of them are very, you know, computer literate. There's several different ways to find them. I can tell you how to do that when you get to that point. But um, you want someone that says, okay, Rick, here, here's a list, you know, or they send you the list, you put it on your phone, whatever, of, you know, 10 people you need to call this week, okay, because it's your 90-day follow-up thing, or 20 people, whatever it is. So this week, you're always, con you know, you're checking them off your list as you're calling them and say, hey, how you doing? probably going to do this in front of the computer because then you can see oh well uh uh oh your daughter susan is she still in uh, ballet oh she's not Wait, what's she doing now oh she's a kickboxer now okay she's an mma fighter okay left ballet doing mma you know i mean so you got to put some of that in so that you can kind of keep track of what's happening in your life now another thing that really works on your database and we'll kind of end the database conversation here because i'm just giving you some highlights but you need to have a have want survey done with all the people in your database so you know what kind of home they're living in that's the have and you know what kind of home they want to move into someday that's the want okay and so you have have wants on all your people now you get a new listing the first place you query 
for, I wonder if I know someone's looking for a house like this with a stream in the back or water in the back or a, a lake nearby, or it's on a lake or whatever. Okay, so you put that in your database, four names pop up, you send them a letter, Dill, Bill and Martha. I listed a home just, just yesterday that had a beautiful waterfall in the back uh, of, of the property. And uh, you mentioned one time that you, you know, you miss living by water. You know, if, if you're interested in looking at this lovely home that you know, is not under contract yet, I'd, I'd love to show it to you. Hey, even if you're not really interested in buying right now, it might be fun for you to see what's available and what the pricing is right right now. I'd love to show it to you anyway. You know, and so uh, how many of you have ever bought something where you went into a store and, you know, you, do, you didn't go in for that. You weren't thinking you'd buy something like that, but you saw it. You thought it was so cool. It was on sale and you ended up buying it. Well, that's the same thing here. I've sold lots of houses to people who say, well, Rick, I'm not really interested in buying right now, but uh, yeah, sure. I'd love to go look at it. We go out and look at it. And, and the wife says something like, well, I don't know where you're going to be living, but it's with me. If it's going to be with me, it's going to be in this house, honey. <laughs> so they end up buying it. You know, it just happens all the time. So it's, it's not a waste of time and, and you can get reacquainted with them. OK, now you pick up a new buyer. They're looking for this kind of house in this market. <laughs> you're going to really appreciate this one. You send a letter out to everyone in your database that has a house that meets those requirements. It says, Dear Bill and Martha, you may not be interested in selling your home right now, but I pick up this fantastic buyer that's extremely well qualified. We're looking for a house that's a lot like the one you're living in. If you have any desire at all to sell right now, um, and give, give me a call. I'll bring the buyer over and show them. This might be the perfect buyer for your house. Uh, you know, looking forward to hearing from you. You know, love Rick. Okay, so here's Bill and Martha. Over the last four years, every month they've received something from you in the mail. Every at minimum of every 90 days, they had a voice contact with you. Over the last three, four years, they've received three or four letters, maybe five, you know, of uh, that you either had a buyer or you had a, you know, a house they ought to buy. You know, who are they going to use for their realtor? You know, it's kind of funny. You talk to people that say, hey, well, um, uh, you know, mom, dad, you know, when you bought this house six years ago, what was the name of the agent? Oh, honey, I can't remember. Honey, do you remember the name of our agent? No, I don't remember. They don't even remember who, what your name was. You know, and, and they would, surveys have shown from the National Association of Realtors, which by the way, Dan uh, Naylor, our illustrious uh, school owner and, uh, uh, you know, the host tonight, uh, is working with the National Association of Realtors on some very important committees. Um, kudos to Dan, who, who puts in a lot of time and effort in making things in our industry better. But the National Association of Realtors have done studies on this, and they have found that the vast majority of people, like, you know, in, in the high 70s, okay, would use the same agent if they could remember who it was. <laughs> they would be happy to use the same agent again but you haven't kept in touch with them. So you want to build a book of business. Well, how do you get from 80 to, you know, to 160,000 a year in commissions with the database? That's how you do it, guys. Well, those are my tips for this evening on the exam and otherwise. As always, please. Got one question in the chat. Oh, great. What is it, Dan? He says, what's the difference between a broker and a principal broker? Brokers come in two flavors. Brokers are either principal brokers or they're associate brokers. Associate broker works for a different broker. You know, I'm an associate broker. I work for a firm and I'm not the principal broker. The principal broker is the one that's responsible for the firm. That's that uh, the buck stops with them. They're the ones that, you know, establish a trust account to keep monies in and are responsible for what the firm does and for what the agents are doing in that firm as well. So uh, I suggest you all get your broker's license. You know, it's kind of a cool thing to do. Um, the stats and statistics on that for the state are showing it's becoming less and less popular. So you might as well do it. In other words, we have a lot more agents than we have brokers. But once you have put your three years in and you've accumulated enough points, 
to show production that you you know you just haven't had a license for three years and never sold anything but you you cert, you have to prove these points and and they're going to test you on points too guys and what it takes to become a broker so this is something, if you don't know this you need to get into that state level material but um then you take the broker's exam it's a little harder they say i think it's a little easier because the questions are much bigger you know they give you more information the more information they give give you excuse me the 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 more they give away but um but they have settlement sheet questions and other things but it that you have to be a little bit more in depth with but it get your broker's license even if you don't want to run a firm or own your own firm you can be an associate broker at that firm does it give you any hoots a bigger split no not particularly but you can say well i'm a broker you know that other guy you know they're just an agent but i'm a broker you know um anyway that's the difference and that's and that's something you need to know for the test as well any other questions as always please call me if i can be of any help the same for dan uh but my number is 801 5 5 6 8000 801 operators are standing by Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Cindy. Thanks, Larry. And we will see you guys out there. Thank you. Bye.